Good morning. Welcome to church. Let's stand and sing this morning. special time. Each month we like to take the first Sunday and do the memory thing. And this is not something new to us. This is something actually that was given to us by Christ himself. We call it communion. Other churches call it the Eucharist, the Lord's table, a lot of different names. But what it is, it's a very special time for followers of Jesus 
to remember why we do this. And it's interesting because, I don't know about you, but my life gets so hectic and so busy. I get involved in a million different things. And so easy to get off track, to get focused on some other stuff, to let life and pressure and problems and politics and all of the other things kind of weigh in on you. And you lose perspective. And that's why I'm so grateful I get to be a part of a church where we remember and we get back to the basics and we have these little memory devices to kind of bring us back to hope. There's a passage where the Apostle Paul was talking to the church in Corinth and he wrote him a letter to talk to them about this thing that we do in the family of God, this communion thing. And he was telling them that it's really, really important that we that we take time to reflect on what we're doing. And this is what he said. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. In other words, he goes, I got this from Jesus. This is what Jesus did and said. So he said, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So for Paul, it was really important that he draw our attention to a couple things. First of all, that communion is a look back. When we celebrate the Lord's table, we're actually going back to the moment where Jesus took the cross on our behalf. He said, when you do this, remember, Jesus is calling us to reflect on his body and his blood that was poured out for us. His body was given because what happens is when we sin, we stand in judgment. There's a great day of the Lord the Bible talks about, the great judgment day. And Jesus actually took the cross as the great judgment day for all believers. The judgment day has already happened for everybody who's put their faith in Jesus in this sense. The judgment and the wrath against our sin was penalized and taken in full on Jesus. That is why he went to the cross, to suffer for my sin, for your sin, for all who would believe. To all who received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. He took our sin on the cross. So to look back at what Jesus has accomplished. When we take the little bread, the little it's a wafer, it's kind of a reminder that his body was on the cross. We take it into us. It's like I want to become the living embodiment of Jesus. We take the juice. We reflect back that his blood was spilled because that's what sin does. It costs life. And Jesus gave his life for us. So we take that to remember that his life was poured out that I could have life. And I'm taking this little cup as a reminder of the blood that was poured out. And it's not like this gross, ucky thing. It's this is the life source. It was a reminder of, to the people of God. This is the life source within us. And I'm taking the life source of Jesus, the life source of God, as my life source. Then he said to look at the present. And right now, he goes, so you reflect back. You look at the present. And he said that this now becomes part of us. The Spirit of God literally comes to dwell in us, to all who believe us, believe in Jesus. Our hearts are open to him. We were saying, Lord, come live in me. And the presence of God is with you for your present day issues, for everything you're going through. God wants to lead and guide and bless and be present with you. That's why it's right now a look at the present. And then it's also a look into the future. He goes, do this until I come. He said, do this until I return. It's a promise that Jesus is returning to the world. And just like his coming the first time, it said in the fullness of time, God sent his son. There's going to be a fullness of time when everything is complete and Jesus returns to establish both his kingdom on earth and his reign on the world, as well as to grab his bride and become what we've always wanted to be in union with we're going to be with God. We're going to be with Jesus. The reign of God begins in the world now because the kingdom has come, but it's going to be in fullness when he returns. So this is a look forward for all of us who are followers of Jesus. This is your opportunity. And for those of you who are investigating, exploring, discovering, you need to understand this is, this is what we believe. So as we pray and then as we get into the, the worship time, 
Make your way to the one of the tables if you want to participate. They're in the four corners of the room. Take a little piece of the bread. Take a little cup. Return to your seats anytime during the next two songs. And as you reflect, Paul said to do this with great reflection, understanding what it is Jesus has accomplished. Reflect on that. And during the worship songs, at any point, you just partake. And in worship, celebrate the past, present, and future nature. Wrath that is poured out lands on Jesus for all who believe and trust in his sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his atonement on our behalf. We put our faith in what he did and thank you for it. And let this be a reminder as your body was given, his blood was shed, that we can now have life now and forever in Jesus. We give you praise and thanks. We do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Let's worship.
Good morning, Journey Church, and those of you who are watching online, you may be seated. My name is Ptolemy Matthews. It's my privilege and honor to give the giving message this morning. And I want to take us back to how everything in creation started. So back in Genesis, the first chapter. And so many of us are familiar with the story. God created the heavens and the earth, and he made the planets and the stars, the sun. He made the sky. He made water. Then he started to create the grass and plants and trees with fruit. And he said that everything was magnificent and good. And then he started making animals and birds in the sky and fish in the sea and elephants and tigers and skunks. I don't know why he made skunks. But then in the 26th verse, we pick up and it says, Then God said on the sixth day, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And the thing to note here is that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. The word for man is mankind. Let mankind, let humans have dominion. It does not say let us. God gave to human beings dominion. That word dominion means sovereignty and control. So he says, I have a plan. I have the way that I want things to go, but I'm not going to force mankind to do it. I want them to choose my way. And so we have free choice and we can make good decisions and have good consequences and good results. But on the other hand, we can also make not so good decisions and have some negative consequences and negative results. God does not force anybody to do anything. He gives us that free will. Let me tell you a quick story. So my wife and I, we own a home here in in, in Lancaster and uh, it's a nice sized yard. It's about 0.35 of an acre. We've got about 30 something fruit trees back there. So some apples and some peaches and and some nectarines and some plums and a few grapevines and things like that. But with a yard that size, if you're not constantly on it, of course, what happens? Overgrowth and all of that. Now I've been kind of busy. The school year is coming to a close. So I haven't had as much time to spend in my yard as I needed. So yesterday morning, I go out there and I'm like, whoa straight chaos everywhere. There are weeds and overgrowth because you know we got a lot of rain during the winter and everything. So it's looking chaotic back there. So I did what every good Christian should do and I dropped to my knees and I closed my eyes and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, you said in your word that you're not the author of confusion. There's a lot of confusion here in this backyard. So what I need you to do is I need you to trim these trees for me. I need you to cut these weeds. And I need you to beautify my yard. Why? So that my neighbors on my left side and my right side can know that there is a God in this home. And then I slowly rose to my feet and I opened my eyes to behold the miracle. And everything, of course, was looking exactly like it was before I closed my eyes. And I think that if God could have said anything to me at that time, he would have thundered from heaven and said, Ptolemy, thou idiot. I'm not dropping a weed whacker out of heaven. I'm not going to come down and trim your trees for you. I've given you authority. You are sovereign here in this area. You have control. I've given you a healthy body. I've given you two working hands. You want the trees trimmed? Go trim the trees. Oh, and by the way, before you start making excuses, God, I don't have the tools. I've also given you a job to be able to earn money, go to Home Depot, and get the tools that you need. We're Christians. And unfortunately, if we're being honest with ourselves, I think that we do the same thing all the time. We are really good at being able to point out everything that's going wrong. Kids nowadays, they're so disrespectful. <laughs> they're bad now. Well, I get that a lot because, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher. So, whoo, some of these kids nowadays, for real. 
there are problems, there's homelessness, there's murder school shootings, there are all kinds of things that are going on, starving children in Somalia, there are all kinds of things going on, and so many times it is our first instinct to close our eyes and kneel down and say, God, please come down and fix this world. And he's like, hold up, I already did that. I already sent my son. I've equipped you, I've given you my Holy Spirit, and then I've also given you every resource that you can possibly imagine. I left you in charge so that when you see something wrong, you put your gloves on and you go to work. I'm more than willing to partner with you, but you need to do your fair share as well. I've already done mine. And so today, the challenge to us, and maybe some of us have never really known that God has given us authority and that he has placed each and every single one of us here in a specific strategic place to where we can have impact upon this world. That is his plan. You're his agent. He's given you gifts. Everything that you have, that you are, is to be used to operate in your authority and to bring everything under the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ. And so what are we doing? Are we taking our job seriously? As the ushers come forth this morning, I wanna challenge us, but I also want to invite us. Maybe we have never before given our control or taken our responsibilities. Maybe we didn't even know, but maybe we can say, God, you know what? I don't even know. I don't know exactly how to do it. I don't have a whole lot, but maybe I have a heart full of love. And maybe somebody who is suffering from depression or having a bad week or month or season, maybe the smile that you want to give will flow through my lips. Maybe the way in which you want to hug them will come from my arms. Maybe that need that they have that's financial. Last time I checked, God's not dropping Brinks trucks full of, of, of cash onto the earth, but maybe I can open up my wallet and bless somebody with the job that he gave to me. And so today, as we pray, I want to invite us to recommit to opening our eyes and allowing for God to work and to bring about the beauty of all of creation that he left in our charge. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have given us and all that you have done for us. You are incredibly good. You are a good, good father. And sometimes I believe that maybe we have shirked some of our responsibilities. Lord, wake us up. Help us to move forward boldly you have placed us exactly where you want us. Help us to operate in those things. Help us to give of our time, of our energy, of our resources, of our money, everything that we have, dear Father. We want to impact this world for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And to do um, announcements this morning is Joaquin. Hello, Journey. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to everybody that's watching online as well. We love you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Joaquin. I'll be giving the announcements today. Um, so fifth and sixth graders, this is your time. Thank you for worshiping with us. Um, you may leave the building. Uh, for anybody who is new, thank you for coming. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time and you just feel new and you've been here for years, welcome to you as well. Uh, there is a sweet treat out by the hot spot. So if you don't know where that's at, just go ahead and exit these doors to the right. Um, trust me, they are good. My wife baked them yesterday. Phenomenal. I had about 10 of them. Uh, so feel free to enjoy those. Um, for all the parents out there, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. If you do have a little one and they do decide to get vocal during the service, we do have a room right there. Um, it is a cry room, so feel free to uh, enter that room and, and just be there present with, with your little ones. And uh, you can definitely hear the service as well. Okay? So for the first announcement, uh, we do have the Connect Night. Ooh, yes. Let me hear it. Have you ever been to a Connect Night? Let me hear it. So... This is a great event that Journey puts on. Um, basically, it's time for us as individuals to come, and as couples, to come and just really get to know other people who are followers of Christ. Um, so basically, we come, we connect, we get to know each other, we, we talk, you know, get to know each other on a personal level, but it's really just to, to build community with each other. 
So feel free to stop by. It is going to be Tuesday, May 7th from 6.30 to 8. Um, there is a taco truck that does come at 6.30, so come early, get some food, sit down, and get to know people. You know, that awesome get to know people part. Uh, so next we have uh, next Sunday, May 12th. Happy Mother's Day, by the way, to all the mothers out there. We love you, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, there's going to be baby and child dedications that Sunday, both services. So if you want more information, once again, as you know, go to the hot spot. They'll give you more information on that. Um, so it's basically a special, if you don't know what it is, I'll give you guys kind of a little snippet. It's a special ceremony where parents can come and dedicate their child to God um, and basically ask how to guide them to follow and get to know Christ better. So feel free to sign up at the hot spot. Once again, it's going to be next Sunday. Uh, both services, they're going to be doing the dedications. Um, lastly, for our kids who just left, uh, but this is the, the known uh, day camp that we're going to be having here at Journey, June 17th to 21st. Yeah, let me hear it. For parents that just need a break, no, nah, I'm just kidding. But for parents that would like to drop their children off, uh, it is first and sixth graders uh, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's, uh, it's basically you come by, you leave your children. Um, there is registration. That's $150. You have to go to the hotspot to sign up, get information there. But it's basically where you leave your kids to just get to know God, get to know Jesus. Um, they can grow in their journey to get to know Jesus, and there's also fun games, and it's an awesome time for them. So we're free to drop them off, let them have their time with God and with Journey. Um, and this is that amazing time where it gets super uncomfortable. Stand up and greet your neighbor. Turn my mic on. Okay. How are we doing this morning? Yeah. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. You hear me? Surprised Joaquin didn't say anything about it. He was extremely excited about Cinco de Mayo. Um, Welcome if you're new. My name is Tyler. I'm one of the team members here at Journey and I'm excited because I get to talk to you this week about our Bottled Up series. And honestly, I'm not going to lie, this is probably one of the most excited, uh, I've, like one of the messages or the series that I'm most excited about because I think this is something that our church um, desperately, desperately needs. And not just ours, but the church. Um, bottled Up Emotions. I think it's something that each of us can relate to or understand to some degree. Got, you know, moments with, uh, you know, things coming together and all of a sudden it's just exploding out of you. How many know what I'm talking about? Start, just read from a place in scripture because I want to talk about, we're going to basically this morning, we're going to hit on one of the ways that we see our emotions bottled up the most and that is in the way we do conflict. Where are my confrontational people at? Where are my avoiders at? Half of you grabbed your phone and pretended like I wasn't here. You know, the, the avoider, I get it. Because I grew up the avoider, so I understand. But this morning, we want to talk about conflict. I want to talk about the way that it works. Um, I'm going to break it up into two different weeks just because I feel like there's way too much to cover. So today I want to just start with, rather than giving you the practical steps, I want to start with the foundation. The foundation of conflict. Because I think if we can start here, then it's going to paint the picture and give us lenses for everything that's going to go from here on out. When it comes to conflict, it starts with our hearts. 
My dad talked a lot last week, and this is why I think this is one of the most incredible series, because where else do you hear the church saying, we've missed the mark in a lot of ways because we've settled for making our messages and our churches about behavior modification rather than heart transformation. I mean, that is a message that we'll preach. Growing up in the church, I felt my whole life that all of this came down to if I played the part, if I looked the part, then that was good enough. How few times did I have teachers at school or, or you know, even my Sunday school teachers asking me, how's your heart? How are you doing? How are you actually? As long as I looked okay and at school, as long as my shirt was tucked in and I had my, my loafers on and my hair parted and everything was looking just right, then I looked like a Christian. The rest you deal with behind closed doors. And I think the church has settled, and in a lot of ways we struggle because it's not that our behaviors don't matter. Obviously they matter. But the problem is, is that when you focus on the behavior, you miss the root of the problem. Our behaviors in so many ways are the symptom to the problem. If you've ever been sick and you've had to go to the doctor, what's one of the first questions they ask you? What are your symptoms? What is wrong with you? Why? Because they want to start to diagnose what's going on. Our behaviors in so many ways are the exact same way. Our behaviors start to showcase what's going on inside, where the the sickness is. And scripture is clear that the sickness resonates in our hearts. I did some research this week just looking at the heart. It is insane the amount of times the Bible references the heart and the role of the heart in anything. It's like, it's as if it's the main thing. I know. Crazy, right? It's as if it's the main thing because, you know, our hearts, you know, it, it's easy to start giving rules and like, this is what it's going to look like. But if we can engage the heart, everything starts from there. Read a verse that's just going to kind of frame everything in 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is just a view, just to give you a vision of what God's, uh, the way that God even sees things. Starting in verse 7, 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by our outward appearance, but the Lord looks at our hearts. I think this is why. That we focus on our outward appearance. I think it's a lot easier to look the part than to actually be what we're looking for. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's easier a lot of times to dress the Christian role. It's a lot easier to change, tweak a few behaviors. All right, fine. When I show up to church, I won't cuss as much. I definitely won't use the F word. Um, I won't talk about what happened last night. I won't talk about the fight that me and my wife had on our way to church. I won't. We're not going to deal with all that. We'll go through the motions. But that's a lot easier than doing the deep work of actually looking at what's going on inside. The problem is this. When we start doing that, we disengage from our own struggle, our own need, our own brokenness, and we start to apply the same rules to the people all around us that we're not even fixing or figuring out ourselves. Our behaviors start, they start to be the end results. If I change my behaviors, then maybe it'll, you know, maybe it'll be fine. But the problem is, so much with our our behavior modification is, you don't end up with any more peace. You don't end up with any more fulfillment. Your life doesn't seem any bad while everybody else is having fun. And so where we're at right now, I want to look at this idea of conflict and the way that it plays out. And the way that the heart plays. In high school, anybody had to, you know... Uh, dissect cats okay so part of my physiology class in high school is we had to dissect cats you put a bunch of teenagers in a room with dead cats it already smells like death and then you add cats to it and it really smells like death but then you give them some scalpels and you start telling them to dissect things stuff just goes out of control especially when you start cutting out body parts and trying to slap people in the face with them You talk about bottled up, you're going to see some ugly come out of somebody real fast. You hit me in the face with a cat liver, and I'm going to get upset. We will have some conflict. You know what I'm saying? Like, this idea of of surgically removing, you know, the things going on inside, this is what we're going to be doing, is looking, taking the deep work, 
taking a look at the deeper insides to figure this thing out. The heart, uh, Proverbs 27, 19 says it this way. As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the person. I'm going to say that again because I just want that to sink in a little bit. Proverbs 27, 19. As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. The reason why this bottled up series is so important is because when things get rough, when the boiling water, you know, when the heat turns up and the boiling water starts to happen inside of us, what comes out is exposing of what's true about who we are. Not the best representation of us, not us when we have it all together, not us on our good Sunday when we got enough sleep and we're getting along with our friends and our spouses. I'm talking about when all of the crap hits the fan. The real. And the way we deal with conflict showcases that because where else do you see bottled up emotion more than conflict a lot of times the conflict for me was interesting because growing up i was the shut down type like you come in like you come at me you make me mad you hurt my feelings you like upset me it was the same response every time strong emotions i just sh- like shut down like the drawbridge came up and there's nobody getting anywhere near me and then at that point, you know, things start leaking out. So then it would be like really passive aggressive and you would just make little comments here and there. How many know what I'm talking about? The passive aggressive comments that just kind of build off and you just kind of build off of that. Make a little snide remark here and just like a little like going to shoot you a little bit over here and like just a little bit, nothing crazy until it turns into a full pledge. Like things build, things build, things build. And then you just outright have this all out war. By that point, it's me versus you, Right? Me versus you. And I know I'm right. Right? I mean, you go into conflict because you know you're right. And you're, the whole goal of conflict suddenly becomes the line's drawn in the sand. The only objective is to get you on this side of that line. Whether I've got to manipulate you, whether I've got to bully you, whether I've got to yell at you, scream at you, whether I've got to give you the silent treatment, I will get you on my side because I know I'm right. That is how we deal with conflict so much of the time, if we're honest. That's how we deal. The goal is not to resolve things, and that's the problem, is then there is no resolution. And so we find ourselves really, really uh, disinterested with conflict because we find ourselves going, what's the point? All it does is end in more chaos. It makes things worse. Life gets more complex. I'm already exhausted. I'd rather just back off. So you have either those who are the speak your mind types. A lot of, it's so funny hearing people be like, you know what? I just tell people, I just speak my mind. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe you should stop. <laughs> just saying. But then we have our others Like, at the end of the day, though, the interesting thing is for me, I would take that person over the person who, like, all along is going, yeah, no, totally, yeah, no, I'm right there with you, you're, this is great, our relationship, this is awesome, and the next thing you turn around, and they have dipped out, and you find out they were talking crap about you for months, they were upset about something, and they never said it to your face, but everybody else knows that you were, you guys weren't getting along. Have you ever been the last one to the party to like the last one to, to find out, wait, we're fighting? There's something going on with us? That's so weird because everybody else seemed to know. Oh yeah, I heard about what happened with you and them. I'm like, dang, I didn't. <laughs> you want to fill me in? And then that's how we play things out in the church. This is the more uh, spiritually acceptable in the church. We call it peacemaking, peacekeeping, but it's fake. And people know that. We know that instinctively. That's why we don't come around when we're not feeling great or things aren't good because we do not want to run the risk of coming real and raw and honest knowing that people probably aren't going to say anything but it's going to get talked about when we're not there. Conflict to me is an act of love. The reason I value it so much is because in, in choosing to confront something, what you are telling me is you are more important This relationship is more important. I love you more than I need to be comfortable. I love you and I value this more than I want to be okay 
on my own to pretend things are okay, more than I want to be safe, more than I want to just protect me, more than anything else, I'm willing to go there with you because this relationship matters. And the people who aren't willing to do that, I have a really hard time trusting. A really hard time trusting. And I think we all do. I think that's why most of the time church feels like an inconvenience when we're struggling because this isn't the safe place that you go to get around the people to do it with. This is the place that you have to put it on. And if you're not, if your behaviors aren't matching right now and somebody saw on your Snapchat that you weren't doing so well just last night or a week ago or whatever, then it's like, I'll just create some space for a little bit. Maybe in a couple weeks they'll forget and we'll come back and we'll just pretend like it's all good. But it's exhausting. Anybody exhausted? Anybody exhausted pretending? Pretending like you're the, the perfect ideal of a Christian that's got it all together when in reality you know you don't? Anybody tired? I am. See, I think conflict is a beautiful thing in the way we deal with it. Jesus is one of the most incredible, like, individuals who showcase conflict. Obviously, he's Jesus, but... Jesus did not avoid conflict. I think this is crazy because the reality is most of us, our idea of conflict came, you don't, who took, you know, math, English, and then the art of conflict? That's not a class. Ain't nothing if you took it. You know, maybe if you are in certain uh, types of, of, of fields of work, you've taken courses on how to do conflict well. But which it's so crazy, though, because every single one of us need it, and very few people have that information. We don't know how to do it well. And so you are doing it based on how you've been taught. We only do what we mirror most of the time because more gets t- caught than taught. So whatever you've seen your parents doing or lack, like lack thereof is what you start to find yourself doing a lot of times. Either that or you find yourself doing the exact opposite of what you're doing because you hate the way they did it. And it's no healthier than the other way. But I love this. This is the way Jesus deals with conflict. And what happens when we settle for religion and when we settle for rules, rather than engaging our hearts with God and with each other, this is what it starts to look like. I want to read this real quick. Actually, I'm going to summarize it because we don't have time for this. Luke talks about this, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan uh, is this story where this man comes to Jesus and he's asking him, what do you got to do to get to heaven? It's the, day, the, like the basic question all of us are asking. Jesus says, how do you translate the law? He says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You guys, we've all heard this. We've, we know this one. Then the man wants to justify himself. So he's like, okay, like, but who's my neighbor? Like, so who do I have to love? And he goes into this parable. And basically the idea, what I love about parables, because this parable is interesting. Because I see myself in this parable. When you get stuck to the rules, the idea behind the Good Samaritan was that there was a priest and a Levite that were on their way to Jerusalem. There was also a man on his way to Jerusalem. The man gets robbed and he gets beaten to the point of almost death. He's naked and like barely surviving on the side of the road. And the priest comes up behind and he's walking by. He sees him, goes along the other side, dips out. The Levite, who is also a religious man, does the exact same thing. Then what steps on the scene is a Samaritan. Samaritan is the the villain of their culture. He didn't agree with everything that they were doing. They weren't on the same page religiously, theologically. And what we find is that, that Jesus is showcasing, and the whole point of the parable is to reveal this man's heart. When you read parables, the whole point is... God, Jesus sucks you into the story, and then when you are at the point where you're already, yeah, yeah, totally, he just like flips the script, and it's always meant to reveal what's going on in our hearts. So he makes this, this dude, the hero of the story, who comes and helps this man, takes him, personally helps him out, and then he goes, who was the neighbor? And he's like, the man who showed mercy. And he had to admit it, even though he didn't want to, because it revealed his own judgmental ugliness in his heart. And he says, go and do likewise. When we settle for religious 
rules and just going through the motions and just trying to be behave and change our behaviors and tweak these things, we start to sound, we start to look like these Pharisees, these religious leaders. Matthew says it, it says it this way in Matthew. I'll start in verse 27. 23, uh, Matthew 23, I'm going to start in verse 27. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Dang it. Jesus just got so real. He just got so personal and raw. And I think we become so guilty of the same thing. It's so easy to be like, all right, just tell me what I got to do. We disengage our hearts. We engage the rules. And what also disengages is our ability to have compassion, our ability to love. You see, in conflict, love and in all, or the foundation of all of this is that love becomes the foundation from which everything else flows. The way this looks like in conflict is you're going to get moments of feeling angry and upset and hurt and you're going to be offended and people are going to do things that are going to, uh, that you're going to have every right to be mad about, to be hurt by. But the truth is there's a difference between making someone your enemy. So when we go about it the way I discussed it before, suddenly we're at a standoff. Both of us are holding our guns and we are shooting at each other. When in reality, the way that God designed us to do conflict is that you and I look at each other and say, okay, we've got to figure this out. So we turn, find the problem, and we shoot it together. The heart of love says you are a human, a person with hurts and, and dreams. And like you, you have your own perspective, your own ideas. I have mine. In pride, I want to say I'm right all the time. You probably do too. We like to be right, especially when we're angry. And most of us, we wait till we're angry to do conflict and to confront people because we feel empowered. You don't have to feel weak then. The hardest thing to do is to confront people when you don't have anger spurring you on. What do you, how, how do you do with conflict when you actually love that person and you feel the love that you have for that person and you are so aware that you don't want to hurt that person, but there's something that needs to be addressed. Can you still do it? Can you do it when you're not hiding behind the anger that gives you permission to just go all out, say whatever you got to say, and just do damage control afterwards? A lot of times we approach conflict and we're just like, I'm going to just rip you to shreds and afterwards we'll figure it out. I'm going to say every mean thing I can possibly think of, I'm going to just wreck you. I'm going to go for the juggler, whatever hurts you the most, any insecurities I know you have, I'm going to just go straight for that. And then we're going to, we'll make up, it'll be fine. The relationship will thrive afterwards. It'll be great. You know what I mean? Like, like you don't walk away going, yeah, I don't know that I'm willing to ever do that again. I don't know that I'm really down for that. When we, be, when we step into the rules, when that becomes the guiding post, the whole point when, it look, when we're looking at the Pharisees, when we're looking at that parable is, yes, God is a God of, of order, not a God of chaos, the way Ptolemy said. But when the rules that he's created get in the way of loving people, we've misunderstood the point. When going through the motions and doing the work and showing up to church causes us to be able to sideline people and say, this is inconvenient, this is not something I want, or I feel like this is not something I can deal with. When we start getting to that point and we are so focused on, I've got to do my quiet time, you know, or I've got to do this and I've got to follow these things instead of, rather than, do you know that scripture talks about if, if you've got an issue with somebody, go leave what you're doing and go deal with it right then you're making a sacrifice and for them that that was a form of worship if you're in a worship service and it occurs to you i've got an issue i've got something i need to deal with with somebody scripture says go deal with it now don't wait matthew 18 talks about how when if someone sins against you go to that person not go to every person Go to that person. Why? Because that is love. That is love. That is love in the midst of anger. That is love in the midst of pain. That is love in the midst of chaos. 
Why is that important? Because at the end of the day, each of us is a culmination of a story. Each one of you has a story. Is there a single person in this room who can raise their hand and say that they've been able to avoid pain and hurt in their life? That you've been able to get out scotch-free of difficulty and disappointment and wounds. Anyone. That is what binds us all. It is what brings us all together. There's not a one person in this room who can say that. So if we can see each other for the human being that we are. Works in progress. Needing lots of patience and grace. We can start to do this. Scripture says it this way in Ephesians. Ephesians 4.32 says, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And there's this quote. I love this quote. It says, like, it's, you probably heard it before. It says, Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind. We live in a tense world. We live in a boundaryless world. We live in a world that tells you just go until you can't go anymore. We live in a world that encourages, um, you know, try to be it all. If you're going to be a mom, you better be, a, you know, a Pinterest mom, an Instagram mom. You better be able to, to document all your moments. You better have your makeup on and your kid better be cute. And you better be taking them to the park with, you know, like, I don't know, baby coffee and, you know, like whatever, and taking pictures, like, with them, you know, having coffee with my baby, you know, like, just whatever, you, all of a sudden, get, I mean, it's insane, and like, you're modeling, and it's baby modeling, and it's all this stuff, and there's pressure, it's pressure, so much pressure to, to behave in the ways that society has taught, what if we removed all of that, and started behaving in the way that God taught, but start with love, you see, if we started with love, and we let God begin to infiltrate our lives, to do the deep work, I guarantee you a lot of the behaviors that we have that are unhealthy would start to naturally take care of themselves in the same way that if you had pneumonia, I would not just give you a cough drop and hope for the best. It would kill you. To change and try to just behave better when you are deeply broken, when you, there is death in our hearts, is a death sentence. It brings death to your relationships. It brings death to your future. And it brings death to your relationship with God. Because it is not what he designed. Our relationships with God are meant to be deeply personal. The reason why the rules don't work is because God's saying, no, 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 no. I don't need the rules. I, I, like, those help you to know how to engage with me. But at the end of the day, I'm just looking for your heart. I'm just looking for the heart. Everyone in this room has a story. Every one of you are the makeup of a story of, of wounds and hurts. Some of us, I think, feel like you started life late to class. Like you got started in class two or three weeks in, and everybody else already has all the notes, and they're already ready for what's going on, and you have no clue what's going on, and you're gimping through life just trying to figure it out, and everybody's gimping, but we're judging each other's gimp, you know? Like, this is, this is the struggle, is every single one of us come with a different form of what sets us back? Yeah. Missing, having missing parents, death, loss, abuse, trauma. All of these things. All of these things affect us. And it's not that our behaviors don't matter. I just believe that our behaviors start to change when we understand that we are loved as the work in progress in this moment in our story as we are and when we accept that god loves us that way we put our expectations into other people that way onto other people that way i can start to look at you and we can start to do this together when we do love conflict with love well i can look at you and say we have a problem now let's figure it out instead of you are the problem let's fix you Our hearts are what God is after. Because this, outside of Jesus, there's not a single one of us with a great heart. Because of sin, the Bible says that we, it, we become calloused. We become hardened. And I love the way Ezekiel says it this way. I'm going to close with this verse. 
Ezekiel 36, 26 says it this way. And I will give you a new heart and I will put in you a, a new... A, wow. Try it again. This was going to be epic. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender heart or a tender, responsive heart. This verse happened during the time of the Old Testament, during the time of waiting where there was 400 years of God not saying a dang thing to his people. But it was already a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. That he was going to come, that he was going to die, that he was going to come back to life, that he was going to ascend to heaven, and that he was going to send his spirit. And when you take that gift and you receive it, and he implants his Holy Spirit in you, and then now this stops being about observing religious rules and go, doing communion because this is just what we do because it's tradition, and instead in bringing back in the heartbeat of it. That God is asking for a daily engagement with us. Why? Because our hearts are going to wander and we're going to every single day need Him to guide us back. We start to engage with the Holy Spirit, recognize the promptings. We start to read our, our scripture verses and our Bibles and we start to recognize that you don't do this to be okay with God. The moment you receive the gift, you are already okay with God. But now God has a life of fulfillment for you, a life of meaning and purpose for you, a life that removes the shame, the guilt, the past, and lets you walk forward with relationships. We can't do this alone. Conflict is one of the single most destructive things because what you see is we get hurt, we get wounded, we get offended in church, and then we just dip out and we go to the next one. The problem is you took yourself with you. You're going to find the same problem at every church you go to. Y'all, this morning, the good news is, as much as you don't have to have it all together, and conflict is going to be a learned thing, and it's going to be something that God starts to teach each of us as he starts to change each of our hearts and helps us to recognize what's going on deep inside, we're going to be able to engage with people with their hearts and what's going on deep inside. The fact that we are a story allows us to see that every single one of us is going to need a little grace. Because when, it, when that, that quote said, everybody's going through a battle, some of you may be, maybe already faced your battle, but some of you are in the middle of your battle right now. And rather than assuming that everybody else, like when, when somebody, you know, hurts your feelings or says something rude or cuts you off or does something wrong, what if instead of our assumption immediately being that they are out to get us, we recognize that maybe they're in the heat of their battle right now. That their pain is high right now. That they're in survival mode just trying to figure it out. We have a little compassion, a little grace because the Lord knows you're going to have your moment of being in the heat of the battle. And you're going to need some people around you to embody that unconditional love of Christ. To be able to say, what you just said to me is not okay. I get that you're in it. I get that there's pain. That's not okay. However, I love you. And we will go get through this together. We will do this together. My prayer for us, I really believe with all my heart, if we could learn some of these things, if we actually started to experience love is not just this hippie movement, feel good, everybody's just, you know, hanging out, and, and we're just loving, we're just loving each other, man, we just love, nah, scripture talks about love in the way that when it says, uh, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, that it says, that you've heard it say to love your neighbor, love your enemies. Love your enemies, the person who you are beefing with right now. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, who, who are against you. This is difficult. This is tough stuff. But I believe if we can start to experience first the good news that God is not after just changing your behavior, folks. We can worship from a place of freedom that we are accepted. God is not surprised that you are a work in progress, even though you might be. We get to embrace today. You are where you are. God loves you where you are. And he's going to move you forward. He's going to bring people around you. We're going to help you do that. And he's going to let them confront you. And you're going to get to confront them. And you're going to do it in love. And we're going to move forward into deep, fulfilling relationships. Life of purpose. Life of meaning. We're going to see this world renewed and transformed day by day as we more and more become the church 
that God asked us to be. Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to have a heart transplant. That you are not, you're not expecting us to fix ourselves. That we can't do surgery on ourselves. That we can't do all of this. That this may feel overwhelming and exhausting and draining. But this morning what you're asking is that we would just engage with you. That this would not be a religious observance showing up to church today, but that we would engage our hearts. I pray this week we would show up in relationship with you. Father, I pray that we would learn to depend on you, to seek you, to let you do the deep work in us, to reveal what's going on in our hearts so that we can turn around and have compassion and grace for those who are in our worlds and the people that you've placed around us. God, has let, God help us to become the church, the bride that you've envisioned, that you've declared. Pray for those who have deep hurts and wounds today, those who are in their season of battle, that you would lift their spirits, that they would experience your peace, that you would give each person in this room wisdom on how to do conflict well, maybe the things that you're pointing out in their hearts right now, that we would be able to listen, to receive feedback, to attack the problem rather than the person, and that each of us would find ourselves more and more in love with you and the people around us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to close in a song.